Hello, and uh, thanks for joining me for this installment of the seminar series that I've been doing here at uh, the Hopkinton Senior Center for, I think, four years now. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at uh, Myrick O'Connell. There are 68 of us there. We have a lot. Uh, as a result of there being that many lawyers, there are about 40 in Worcester and 20 here in Westboro, close by, and then another 10 in Boston, which doesn't add up to 68. I don't know why that happens. So um, the nice thing about there being that many lawyers is that everybody gets to specialize, and I do nothing but elder law. Um, a lot of my presentations are on specific uh, we'll, we'll call it legal, more legal elder law topics. Um, this one is about something which is, I think, more important. <laughs> I think more important to many of my clients, um, which, and to all of us, which is, to, is making sure that you have thought out um, how you want to be treated if you're really sick, uh, especially how you want to be treated if you're in the condition that you can't tell people how you want to be treated, right? Because at that point, imagine what a bummer that would be, that you're in the hospital or wherever and you, you're being treated other than how you want to be treated and you're conscious, but you can't say it. How bad is that, you know? So I want to talk about that and specifically about it in the context of the Honoring Choices, um, um, I will call it an initiative. Um, Honoring Choices has, is, being, is being the main kind of uh, person who's running this is an attorney named Ellen D. Paola. Um, there's a website if you want to learn more about Honoring Choices. And their whole point is to encourage people like you to have these kinds of, to think about this and to have these kinds of conversations. Um, so I wanted to, and, 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 a, and a key piece of this is the healthcare proxy, uh, the document through which you empower someone to make decisions if you're unable to make them yourselves. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about this, that a little bit. Uh, a second key piece is the so-called MOLST form, M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Um, that is the, the one and only document that you can sign which, would, which, which may trump uh, what your, the, your healthcare proxy may wanna do. So it's a really important document. Um, and then we're going to talk about a, the, the personal directive. A personal directive, this is a non-binding, non-legally binding document. Living wills in Massachusetts are not legally binding. Everybody thinks they are because they read, whether through, whether through five choices or through various other things, um, that say, oh, this is a legally binding document. And that's true in many states, but not here. So it's not a legally binding document, but it is a document that, that and other documents like it, try to frame to help your um, proxy in the event that you can't make a decision to make those kinds of decisions. So I, I, I asked two guests to come here today. One is Ann Wilkins, who is the Director of Case Management at Milford Regional. So, I, and I know, you know, it, we don't, you don't have an official hospital in, Hopkinton, but that's pretty close. I mean, you're off really close, so we figured it'd be appropriate to have her come up. And Debbie Gittner, uh, Deb is a, a geriatric care manager. I've spoken many times here before about geriatric care managers and their importance. They are people like Debbie and her partner, Linda Sullivan, whose backgrounds are typically in social work and in nursing, and who have decided that their goal uh, in life in, in, in is to help people to do case management, basically, for folks who are at home, uh, who are seniors, and who are trying to figure out how to get from here to death, for want of a better term, how to, how to make sure that their lives are as good as they can be for as long as they're here. So, um, briefly, the point about uh, honoring choices is to encourage you to think about what your plan might be by helping, you, by helping to kind of talk about what the elements of your plan are. Now, your plan pretty much ends when you die. So the goal of the exercise is to make sure that you've got a plan that deals with, as you're kind of thinking about it, everything that happens before you die, although there are a few things that you want to make sure of kind of for after you die, like how do you want to be, how do you want your remains, that's what, that's what you turn into when you die, is your body turns into your remains, how do you want those remains to be treated? But, in, but basically, it's about what happens before you die. Um, the, the, the Honoring Choices Toolkit consists of 
uh, a, set of, a set of things. The two major documents are the healthcare proxy and the personal directive. Uh, I'm going to show you a copy of that personal directive, but if you want to actually get one, they're in the back. I brought copies of the, of the personal directive that the, that, that the Honoring Choices program has developed and, and works with. Remember, they're not legally binding documents, but if you fill it in, it may help you think about what you really want, and it's really going to help your proxy later on. Um, now, the healthcare proxy, I believe that we, we even brought copies of the healthcare proxy that they use, although there are a number of these. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about, so here's, here's, a, the, here's a, little clip, a little clip, a little snippet of law. There is a little law to this. Um, healthcare proxies need to be signed by two witnesses. They can be anybody except the people that you're naming as the proxies. As your, by the way, the person you name in the proxy is not called a proxy. It's called an agent. You're naming a healthcare agent, an agent to act on your behalf. The, the, the way the, the document through you which you do that is called the proxy. The witness can't be one of your uh, agents, and it also can't be somebody who's, who is working in the hospital where you are, <laughs> uh, or in a, 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 a nursing home, unless they are your blood relatives. Okay? They don't want these things to be inappropriately witnessed, I'll put it that way. Um, it only applies, remember, healthcare proxy, as opposed to powers of attorney, that typically apply immediately as soon as you sign them. Healthcare proxies only start applying when your doctor has said in writing, so has written, that you are not capable of making a medical decision. That can be because you're temporarily out of it, because you've had, you know, you're in a coma, you're getting operated on, whatever. Um, or because you're kind of permanently out of it, but the point is that, th that the healthcare proxies um, um, legal consequences continue until uh, either the doctor says that you can start making legal decisions uh, or until you revoke the proxy. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, remember, though, one of the nice things about designating a healthcare proxy is that even if you have not been declared by the doctor unable to make medical decisions. The proxy can get your medical records and talk to the doctor about your medical records. So you've kind of appointed someone who can have those conversations, not make decisions for you, but have those conversations. So that if you're, you know, the proxy hasn't been invoked, which is usually the term that the doctors use, but you want somebody else who can like translate, what in the world is it, you know, what, what does that stuff say, you know? This gives you the ability to have somebody that you can have this kind of conversation with, somebody that you trust. The limits of a healthcare proxy. First of all, uh, the most form. Um, so uh, um, last, last week, I think, I went to a, a presentation that was done by one of the regional administrators of one of the regions that administers or that uh, uh, supervises EMTs. Uh, because one of the great significances of a, of a MOLST form, the MOLST form has a set of instructions in it regarding treatments that you don't want in certain circumstances. And we're going to talk about those. Don't intubate me. Don't uh, resuscitate me. Don't do some things. So, so one of the things that is right in the MOLST form is a provision that says um, this form can be overruled by your proxy, right? Um, so you should be aware of that, that legally, if, they, if the medical proxy has been invoked, your, um, your agent that you named in your, in your uh, healthcare proxy can overrule whatever you have said, right? The trick, though, is that if I'm an EMT and I go to your house and you're on the floor and your agent, typically your spouse would be the one that would be, th be there at that point, but your, whoever that agent is, is there and they find the MOLST form, and the MOLST form is supposed to always be on the refrigerator, right? The reason why it's supposed to be on the refrigerator is because that's the only place that the EMT is going to look. They're only going to look on the refrigerator. If they can't find it there, they're going to stop because it's an emergency. You're on the floor, right? So if they find that MOLST and they, pull, and, they, and they pull it out, and it says, do not resuscitate, and your proxy is standing next to you but, and says, oh, no, I want you to resuscitate. The EMT is going to follow the MOLST form and is not going to resuscitate. The reason? Because remember, the, 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 the proxy only takes effect if a doctor has determined in writing that you're incapable of making a medical decision. 
So right now you're on the floor. You don't look like you're capable of making a medical decision, but a doctor has not determined in writing that you're incapable of making a medical decision. So as far as the EMT is concerned, they're following the MOLST form, okay? So the MOLST form is, is very important. Um, and then we just talked about living the personal directives, which th that's what we're gonna have the broader conversation about here. The document that is not, we all agree, is not legally binding, but really important. Um, a couple of things about, um, uh, once again, the effect of that proxy. Um, you can always refuse treatment. You personally can always refuse treatment. If you're in the hospital or the nursing home and the doctor has said, um, this uh, has signed the right, right in writing and said you're incapable of making a medical decision. And the doctor starts doing something. And you say, I don't want you to do that. Legally, what you just did is you, you revoked the, 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 your own proxy. Um, and you can always do that. If your proxy is in the room and the, you, you, you and you and the doctor and the proxy and the doctor says, I want to operate. And the proxy says, that's fine. And you say, oh no, I don't want to. Legally, what you just did was you revoked your healthcare proxy. And you always have the right to do that. For purposes of revoking your proxy, you are always presumed to be competent. So the doctor can't say, oh, they, she's crazy. She can't do that. Doesn't make it. The statute says you're presumed to be competent. This statute was designed really to protect individuals, to protect the individual who is signing the form. Now, uh, a little bit about the MOLS form, M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. This is the form that has incorporated into it what used to be called the DNR form, um, but has gone much um, more broadly than that. So I'm going to talk about that briefly. Um, I'm, first, I'm just going to go through the sections on page one. There are, there are two pages to this. Actually, there's the back side and the front side, right? Yeah. So page one is the only side that the EMTs look at, right? because it's, it, it involves any of those kinds of emergency decisions. They are uh, either do not resuscitate me or attempt to resuscitate me. So, on resuscitation, one of the, I'm, now I'm uh, clearly not a doctor, I never could have done that stuff, I, I'm only a lawyer. But one of the, uh, there's a wonderful doctor named Michelle Ricard, who's a gerontologist who has done these presentations with me. One of the statistics that she gives from a, a Canadian study uh, done a little while ago, was that if you are over 70 years old and you get resuscitated, or a, a resuscitation is attempted, the chances of success are about 25%. That is, of getting you going again right there. The chances, it once, if they've gotten you going again, of your living more than 30 days are also 25%. So your chances of getting resuscitated and living more than 30 days are, is 5%. It's 5%, okay? And, and, and you want to think about that given the fact of what resuscitation is, that it is the, the, this pressing down on your ribs, and oftentimes through your ribs, oftentimes the ribs all get cracked, so that they can push down on your heart to get your heart to see if it'll start going again. So you need to understand that if, you, if, you, if resuscitation is attempted and doesn't work out, then what you've basically decided on, if you're getting resuscitated, and this is what the EMTs will do, unless you have a MOLST form, or unless your proxy is there saying no, is you've decided on an incredibly painful death. Incredibly painful, right? So, you know, and it's up to you to decide that. It may be that you decide, well, that's worth it for me, even though the chances are really low. It, you know, it, for, it's often much more worth it if you're 25 years old, and the reason why this happened was you got into a car accident or something, and chances are you're going to be fine, right? But it may not be, or it may be, but the point is, it, if you don't make the decision ahead of time in writing, then that's kind of what you're, what you're getting. Vent ventilation uh, similar, is a similar kind of thing. Ventilation uh, means basically taking a tube and putting it down your throat and pushing air into your lungs so as to get your lungs to breathe again. We're gonna take all questions at the end. So as to get your lungs to breathe again. Um, it may be that you do want that, but it's, but it's not pleasant, right? And one of the issues, once you've been intubated, is that it's often tough to get de-intubated. Uh, as I've heard people say at the hospital, you know, once you're intubated, nobody really wants to unplug you after that, you know, because they're all afraid of responsibility. So, so, so it's, it's a, a, an issue. Third, um, and this is the one I always try to emphasize, is this do not hospitalize question. 
If many of you have been to my presentations, you've heard me talk about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And, they, and what their goal in life is, is to die and be buried in the backyard. They want to stay in their house. Well, if you want to stay in your house, in this situation, <clears throat> you may not want to go to the hospital. If you want to die a natural death, trust me, it will not happen at the hospital. <laughs> That's not how you die when you're in the hospital, right? So this is actually, to me, one of the most important things, because the EMTs say, if you've checked off in the box, do not hospitalize, no matter what anybody says, you know, when you're there in your house, they're going to leave you in your house. They haven't told me whether they put you back in your bed. I don't, I don't, I don't know that. But I know they're not going to bring you to the hospital, okay? Um, you need to sign, right? Or uh, your um, agent, your healthcare agent, your proxy can sign for you and can change this form for you if the doctor has declared in writing that you're, that you're incompetent, okay? Um, and healthcare proxies last forever unless, A, you have signed on this section on the front page that says this is going to expire. I put an expiration date on it. I have never any, ever seen anyone do this, right? Uh, or if you sign another healthcare proxy, right? So if you do this proxy that's got all of the, that, that, that has the, if, if you do a proxy that has your, 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 um, the, your, all of your correct information, right, and you sign another healthcare proxy when you go to the hospital, you've now, you've now uh, revoked your old healthcare proxy. But the point is the most form will go forever unless you have otherwise said that it's going to terminate at some point. Page two, I'm just going to mention briefly, um, page two is designed to deal with, I'm going to go back to that intubation case, for example. So you've been intubated so they could get you to the hospital, right? But oh, you don't look very good, right? And so uh, it may be that you want to be checking this box that says, uh, I want intubation, um, um, but only short term, but only short term. So, so that you, it is going to be known that unless your proxy, your agent named in your proxy decides otherwise, if it looks like you're at the hospital and you, and you shouldn't be intubated anymore, they're, they're, they're going to be able to pull that out because you've said you only wanted it short term. Now, once again, that's a gray area where you don't want your doctor to have to be, right? So in general, you want to make sure that, there's, that, that you've got a proxy so that there's an agent so that once you get to the hospital, somebody can be figuring that stuff for you. Um, there, were several, there were several additional sections um, dealing with, with that, and I'm not going to spend time on those. The whole question of wh whether you want dialysis. Do you want to be artificially fed? Do you want to be artificially, um, do you want liquids to be artificially put into your, into your veins? All kind of questions that you want to talk to your doctor about. And by the way, your doctor um, really wants to talk to you about this. And not only that, even gets paid for it now. It, until, until January of last year, uh, doctors, if you, call, if you set up an appointment with your doctor to talk about how this plan was supposed to be working, um, your doctor may not have been crazy about doing this because it's a free visit, right? Because Medicare wouldn't pay for this. As of January of last year, Medicare, cha Medicare changed their regulations so that they will now pay for a half hour consultation with your doctor to talk about this stuff, okay? Um, with that, um, and we already talked about it, go to the refrigerator. The personal directive. So once again, there are copies of these in the back, I think you, and, and we're, and we're gonna talk about the different sections of the personal directive. Because um, I think they, they may help you think about f kind of framing um, what you may want to be doing, what you may want to be doing with the rest of your life, especially if, you, if you're starting to get frail. And for that, I'm going to sit down um, and, and with, with, with my friends Ann and Deb, and we're going to talk about those issues. So the first, the first of the sections of the personal directive talks about your personal values. So it talks about what are your preferences? So what are your values and beliefs? What do you think a good, quali a, a, qual a good quality of life is? What do you think makes life worth living? Has anybody here read um, Atul Gawande's book called Being Mortal? No? Okay, so I'm just gonna, see I don't often do this, but I'm, li I'm recommending reading Atul, uh, Being Mortal, Atul Gawande, A-T-U-L, Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E. So Atul Gawande, 
is a uh, doctor who grew up in Ohio. His father was a, medic, a surgeon in India who immigrated uh, when uh, uh, Tool was very young. And he grew up to be a doctor, uh, be a very well-known doctor who's practicing at one of the Harvard hospitals in Boston and teaches at Harvard. Um, but he wrote this book really to talk to doctors. But it's so wonderfully written. You ought to read this book because it talks about this whole notion that in, t in today's world, um, you can live for a long time, a lot longer than you used to. It used to be, and I, remember, I still remember this like, just little chart that he had. He said, you know, the old way that you lived was you lived and lived and lived, and then all of a sudden you kind of fell off a cliff, and things started slowing down, and then you died. And now that cliff may have lasted a week or it may have lasted a year, but it didn't last like for five years, right? But now, he said, you know, you go along and then an incident happens. You have a stroke, you have a something or other. And, or you have cancer, right? And, but you live, right? And so now you're, now you're still living. But it's a little worse, you know? Your quality of life isn't as good. You're, more, you're weaker, blah, blah, blah. And then you kind of live, and then something else happens, and then you go down a little bit more. And that keeps happening until eventually you die. And one of the kind of questions in the book was, where along that continuum do you want to be saying, I don't want to try to get better again. You know, I don't want to try to keep living at the price of going down another notch you know, in, in terms of how this, how this works. So, th so those are my broad takeaways. But I wanted to talk to Ann and Deb because they're dealing with this all the time. Ann? Just a comment, it's a very good book, but if you prefer to listen to it on tape as I did, it's, it's very good on tape as well. Um, but Excuse me, is she talking loud enough that you're going to pick her up? This is my friend from Hudson, Hopkinton Cable, by the way. Thank you, Hopkinton Cable, for doing this. Thank you. We appreciate this. Go ahead. Um, I, I have just seen situations where um, people didn't think this through, and the people who suffer from that are your families. So it's really a kind and helpful thing to do for your family to think about this, to write down what you want to do, because I can guarantee you at the end of your life, as it was at the end of my own mother's life, you struggle with those decisions. What would she have done? What would God want you to do? You know, all of a sudden now we've got God in the picture. I remember saying, is this an ordinary or an extraordinary thing that I'm doing, taking my mother off life support? So really, to, to, to put the, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, it's not a pleasant thing to hear about when we hear it, but it is the reality of the situation. And if we put some thought into that and put those thoughts out on paper, the benefit to your family members or your loved ones are beyond measure. And you and, and, take guilt away from it. You take guilt away. And, and I'm gonna ask Deb to comment, and by the way, as opposed to my usual format where I only take all questions at the end, I'm going to do them by section here, so that if there are people who have got particular questions or comments regarding any of these, I like, we'd like to hear about those as we go along. Deb. Yes. And the statistics that I just read, 90% of people think about their own mortality. You know, what do I want? Do I want resuscitation? It crosses our mind. 90% of people think about it. 27% actually put something down in writing and talk to their family about it. Because it's easy to think about it, it's harder to talk to your family. And that's the gap that you're addressing, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. families are in the emergency room or faced with life crisis and really are struggling. What, what, what did my mother say two years ago? Oh my gosh, I didn't listen hard enough when we had that brief conversation because we were talking about somebody else getting sick and dying. And my, what did my mother say? What did my father say? Did, I, did they want that? Did they not want it? I'm right now going through a personal situation with my father-in-law. October 28th, he was sent to Metro West Hospital. They did not have the sophisticated um, means to manage his medical care and rushed him to Mass General Hospital that afternoon. And my husband went with him in the ambulance. They were doing 85 miles an hour. My husband was, could see the odometer and said, I've never been so scared in my life when, when a local hospital says, you need to get rushed to, as I call it, the big guns at Mass General right now, fast. 
And I stopped off at the apartment, my father-in-law's apartment, picked up a few things thinking we were going in for curative. He likes certain things, he needs his you know, headphones, he needs a few things. So I stopped at the apartment thinking we, I bring these things if he's gonna stay for a few days. As I'm parking the car, my husband calls me and said, I'm with the doctors, I don't know, I know what to do, I don't know what to do. The only option is to put him on a vent, a trach, and a feeding tube. I have to make a decision right now. And <coughs> I said, could you say that again? I, I actually heard it, but I didn't hear it. And my husband put the doctor on the telephone and I said, I'm on the fifth floor, there are no spaces in this garage, Can do we have to decide in seconds or can I at least come into the emergency room and we can talk for a few minutes? And he said, no, you have time to talk. And I kept saying to my husband, but we've had this conversation with your father, he does not want this. I, I, I know it's really hard. We're not ready to say goodbye quickly. This was a gentleman, this is a gentleman who's 93 years old, driving a car, living independently, doing his own shopping. Uh -oh. um, we provided no care, dressing himself, volunteering on a weekly basis in a local nursing home. I mean, he was not ill. The last time he had a health physical was December 2016. We had another one scheduled with his primary care for this December. He was that healthy. Took a little bit of meds for high blood pressure, cholesterol, but it wasn't causing him any, any issues, any medical issues. So again, I, I got into the emergency room and I kept saying, we ha I brought the piece of paper that ha I had made sure my father-in-law had written with his wishes. And I said, they're here. We have to honor them. Not that we wanted to say goodbye at that moment and not that we wanted to deal with it on a Saturday afternoon when I'm driving in thinking curative, not finale, finality here. But we chose not to, with tears in our eyes, with a hard heart, we had to say and show the doctors the paper and kept saying, we are following his wishes. We are following his wishes. He was, although he was, although he was <coughs> very ill, we <coughs> asked him one more time, just in case he changed his mind because we needed to know that now we're in a crisis, do you change your mind because we will do what you want. And he heard us, he heard the doctors, and he kept saying no, 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 no. And it was very hard because they expected him to pass that night. So much so that Mass General said to us, we're gonna put you in a private room. They gave us the most magnificent room on the 22nd floor overlooking the Charles. I mean, we had not only a beautiful room, but we had a desk, a chair, a couch. I mean, everything so that we could stay overnight with him and we could be with him. That was the plan. Now it's November 7th. He has <laughs> chosen no feeding tubes, no ventilation, no trach, no NG tubes, nothing. He's still here. I'm not quite sure why. We are slowly watching him decline because he's had no water and no food since that Saturday morning. And even with hospice support, it is difficult to watch, but what we continue to say as a family is this is his wishes. It's hard for us, it's gotta be harder for him. And you know, again, he does, did not want this and it's a struggle for him, but it's his choice, his life. And I think when he does pass, we're going to say he did it his way and we're gonna hopefully feel good that we have allowed him to pass the way that he wants on his terms. Um. Questions or comments? By the way, this is, and, and, and I always keep telling my clients, I say, you know, this is, don't make your kids decide for you, right? You decide. You, this is your life. This is your life. You, it's all well and good that, you know, oh, I really want to make sure dad's, you know, I fl I'm going to fly home from Los Angeles. Well, that's great. So I can, you know, shake his hand before he dies. But do you want that? I mean, do you <laughs> Do you want that? Do you want that? Ex it's your decision. Questions or comments about any of this or, or related stories or anything? 
No, I can share with him. I have watched families. You know, I've been a clinical social worker for well over 35 years. I don't want to quite give away my age completely. Um, but I have watched families struggle. I've watched siblings fight. You know, in the emergency room, in a in a room, in a patient's room, in a nursing home. Um, I think this is what mom would want. I think this is what dad would want. And they don't always agree. You know, children have different relationships with each of their parents. They love them all the same, but they also have different bonds. And some may be willing to say it's time a little bit easier. Some may say have a little bit of guilt and say, I don't want them to go. I don't want to say goodbye. And it's not about what their mom or dad wants, but it could be about what the sibling wants. And again, that's why you, it's, it's hard to have that conversation. It's even harder to write it down, but it, it is very much important. <clears throat> On the Honoring Choices site, there's a place called CAKE, and I don't know why it's C-A-K-E, but if you get into that site, it asks you question by question. And this is a document that can help you formulate your decisions. And there's also a place for I don't know. I don't know. So it's something that you can go back to, look again, think about it, talk to your primary care physician, talk to any specialist. If you see a cardiologist, if you see a GI doctor, you know, talk to them about your disease and your prognosis. Talk to your children and say, you know, I'm ambivalent about this. In this situation, would, maybe you could start, but take it away. Maybe you can't, but at least they know that you're ambivalent about something. So in that crisis, they can say to the doctor, if you try and it's not successful, can we then stop something? And, and there are times that that can happen with intravenous, with certain medications. You know, some things are cut and dry, like starting resuscitation. There is, it's either yes or no. Um, but other things, sometimes you can try and then pull back from. So, Anna, I'm curious. So, if you have someone at the hospital who who has not done this, mm -hmm. right, and doesn't have kind of a, but who can still kind of communicate, do, do is do 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 you folks actually regard it as part of your your charge to have some of those conversations, or are you focused more primarily on you know your here's your time here because these folks may be going home because mm -hmm. these folks in many cases may be going home, and I guess I'm especially interested in terms of this whole question of. What constitutes a kind of a good life, you know, or can you just talk to that? Sure. I, from the very beginning, um, my department is a department of nurses and social workers. We are asking, can you hear me? I'm sorry. My department <clears throat> is a department Would it be better if she stood? Would it be, would it be better if you sat? No? I don't know. Nurses and social workers. And they ask the questions from the minute they meet them on. Do you have a health care proxy? Do you have a health care proxy? Let me tell you why it's so important. Because if you don't have a healthcare proxy and you need to go from that point, you could be very, very, very well. But if you don't have a proxy, think of it this way, forget the resuscitation. You can't go from point A to point B because nursing home rehabs won't take you without a proxy. So you have to have that done. The second thing is, is I want you to think about what will happen if you don't have it. You're not changing the course of events. But now, your family has to go to a lawyer. They have to pay money for a guardianship. Where the healthcare proxy is just a, a piece of paper. And worse, if you don't have any family members or friends or clergy that are going to be your healthcare proxy, the state will make your decision. So you see, at the end of the day, you want that power. You want to say, this is my life. This was a life that I, I lived well. And this is how I would like to see my life end. But no one, none of us gets out of it easy. If you don't have that piece of paper and you walk into a hospital, your family's not going to have the, the luxury is not the word I'm, I'm, I, I would like to say, but your family's not going to have the ability to make that decision for you. Then it becomes a legal issue. Am I right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and I'll get, I guess I'm just, yes, yes sir. Uh, can you give me the full address for that Kate website? Or the Honoring Choices website? If I... I, is it did I did I not put it on the on the on, on that slide? I think on the honoring choices slide, if I recall correctly, that website is there. If not, I'll, if not, 
we'll find it. <laughs> yeah, I have well, some papers, and I'll be happy to share that with you. Yeah, because some of the, the uh, we, as I mentioned, we brought copies of several of the forms from, from the Honoring Choices website, and they're on the back shelf, and I'm sure that website, the, the website address is there, right? But by the way, that, that, that leads me to realize I should, if it isn't on a slide, I'm looking at the, my, my friend from, from Hopkinton Cable, we'll, we'll get a banner to make sure that it's there for other people who are watching this show, okay? Other questions, comments on, 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 on here, okay? Cause that, but, and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna mention one other. Remember, so if you're in the, you're in the hospital and, and if the healthcare proxy has been, in, it has been invoked, right? Um, then that person is also making decisions, maybe not life or death decisions, but decisions regarding what the course of your care is going to be. Are, we, are they trying to design a course of care that's getting you home, or are they not? Because, you know, you've, you, because your, your agent feels, as you, that as far as you're concerned, that's not what they're trying to do, right? Those are really important decisions, and, and those, are di those are directions which your agent is now making for you if you've got a proxy. But if you haven't told him what direction to take, he's flying blind. I'm just going to give you one other thing that I want to mention. So Deb was referring to that conversation, that, and, and, or that trying to remember. So what did Ma say exactly, you know, about how she would, you know, wanted to be treated? So imagine that you're the, 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 you're the sister that lives in San Francisco and wasn't at that conversation. And now Ma's in the hospital, right? And your sister, who you might get along with or might not, you know, is saying, you know, dad really wanted me to unplug him right now, right? So, and, 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 and the one that's over here is the proxy, but the one that's in San Francisco is getting really angry, saying, oh, I don't think that's what dad would have wanted at all, you know? Is, wouldn't it be great if there were a writing Right? Not a legally binding writing, right? But just a writing from you, from you to your agent saying, so this is how I want this to happen. So in terms of that, your agent dealing with typically all the other kids, this is usually what happens, right? There's a way of saying that's the end of the story. Because the issue, because if you're doing a healthcare proxy, um, so there, there, I, I have been having this, uh, legal discussion with Ellen DiPaola because she has indicated in presentations that she believes that you can name two proxies at the same time, or two agents at the same time, and I disagree with that. Reading the statute, I think you can only name one at a time. That you can name an alternate in the event that that person isn't serving, but, and that the idea behind that is, if I'm the doctor, I don't ever want to be hearing an argument between two people regarding what to do with the patient. I only want to talk to one person. <coughs> So the point is, there's going to be somebody who is the proxy, but then there are going to be all those other people, like all the other siblings, who are certainly going to be interested, right? So once again, a writing really helps you in that case. Uh, yes, yes, sir. You mentioned uh, that if you had nobody to be your agent, that the state would do it. Could you bypass that? Let's say you don't want to put your kids against each other and just go with the state instead of your family or friend? The question is, could you just go with the state? Well, the, see, the state... There isn't a, <clears throat> there, I'm going to do two things on that. First, there is no public guardianship law uh, in Massachusetts. There is no provision that in the event that there aren't other players, um, the, 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 the probate court can just name a public guardian. I'm going to say in parentheses, I'm not sure that I'd want that either. I just read this article, it was in the, in the New Yorker two weeks ago, about the, the, the Nevada, where there is a public guardianship law, and where there have arisen these predators, for want of a better term, right, who have basically gone, in, gone into cahoots with some of these fo folks from the hospitals or from the nursing homes that, that don't want to take responsibility for these people so that they could get themselves named public guardians. And then they're in control of these people's lives and assets, and they're making a bundle. So it's not clear to me that's the direction we want to take. Right, I, I kind of like the idea. So courts- I was cautioning against that. I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Right, but so so in these so in in these cases, typically courts will appoint though a third party. They'll appoint a lawyer. They'll appoint a some a somebody else. Right. Can I also make a comment before we get to the next questions? Um, it, when there are no, a number of children, you have to think about which child will be able to stand firm and honor your choices. And you're not choosing one because you love one better. But you may right. choose one because you know, as in my husband's, as in my father-in-law's situation, he chose my husband 
because he knew that he would do Cause it. Because he, he knew that her husband was married to her. <laughs> <laughs> that was the main reason, right? <laughs> and, and that, you know, my sister-in-law would not have stayed firm and followed his wishes, and my brother-in-law would have just easily, because he kept saying, don't do that, don't do that. So it isn't that um, they, it's not that my father-in-law loves my husband more, it's just that he knew he would stay the course. Um, as hard as it is. So when you choose somebody, whoever it is in your family, make sure you know everybody knows, I think they'll be able to do it the easiest. Yeah. And that, that's a good point because it may not be your children at all. It may be your best friend. And your children don't have any recourse to that. This is a choice you've made. So pick the person that you know will, will carry out your wishes. And I just want to say one other thing because I know we're talking a lot about pull the plug and pull the... We've had situations in the hospital where it's just the opposite, where a family has said, if it were me, I would probably take them off the vent. But their wish was to have everything done. So as long as you know, we follow that wish no matter which way it goes. If yes, yes, yes ma'am. If you have a power of attorney in addition uh, to the medical person, wouldn't your power of attorney Take over? The question is, if you have a power of attorney in addition to the health care proxy, in that case, wouldn't your power of attorney take over? And the answer is usually no. Oh, really? No. Usually, the, usually the, the, it, for a couple of reasons. One, the, the power of attorney, um, um, the, the, the point of the power of attorney is to have somebody make sure, have somebody who can take <coughs> care of your legal issues for you. <coughs> And I always tell people, your attorney, your, your agent there, and that's called an agent also, or an attorney, an attorney in, of, in fact, um, it can do everything for you except make your medical decisions, right? Now, you could try to design that power of attorney so that it also include those powers. I very seldom see that. I see that from other states, but not from here. Second thing, though, is that the, that the, that the, um, um, the rules for um, what has to be on the document are different. Healthcare proxies have to have two witnesses, powers of attorney don't. So often, and the typical power of attorney doesn't, right? Um, neither document has to be notarized. But so the point is that person isn't going to do it for you. So you really want your healthcare proxy. And you want to, and you want to have it, and you want to keep, ideally, the original. My suggestion to people is always give your proxy to your, to your PCP, to your primary care physician. And then if you're at the hospital, your primary care physician can fax that over or email it to the hospital. Because if you give it to the hot, maybe Milford's have, different. In Marlboro, they throw them away. We scan them, yeah. and they're in the computer, so we can just oh, that's great. have it come up. Because if you don't have it in an emergency, you don't know what you're doing. Thank you. Right, right. Yes, sir. That partially addresses my question. So I fill out a proxy in a mold's form, and I give them to my PCP. Now, I travel to Pennsylvania, and I'm in need of care, emergency care. Is it prudent for me to have a copy of those with me? Oh, and will they be on it wherever I go? At your most form will not. It will not. Your healthcare proxy probably will. If it was validly executed in the state at which it was executed, there's an interstate compact regarding that. This most issue, Ellen, had, was, De, Attorney DePaolo was just referring to the fact that they're trying to figure out a way that nationally they can get everybody's legal system to buy into this. But you can imagine getting 50, getting you know, you know, us in Nevada to agree on anything? Forget it. So that's going to be a long time. So if you're moving to one of those states or going on vacation, Travel. right, or for, I have a lot of clients, as, as many of you know, I, so, so I, Thursday for me is always Island Day. I either go to Nantucket or the Vineyard. So I have a lot of folks there whose family shows up in the summer. And I always tell them, you don't need a new proxy, but you may want to do one of these most forms for while you're here. If you happen, you know, if you happen to have a bad day swimming, you just as soon know that you know, everything's going to be in effect here, so you want to do another form. Ma'am. I have a question regarding that. What is the difference between resuscitation and CPR? Because people swimming all the time are resuscitated, and you'd certainly want to be resuscitated from that. So what is the difference between CPR and resuscitation, and what, what would it apply to differently? Now, I'm gonna, now, none of us here is a doctor, right? I'm going to give you my, I'm the least of, of the, doc, I'm the least like a doctor here, but my sense is that cardiopulmonary resuscitation is resuscitation, it is, try, well, it is resuscitation, it is getting you to breathe again as opposed to getting your heart to start again, right? It's a mechanism to get you to, to breathe again, right? 
So it's more like artificial, whatever it's called. I don't know. <coughs> Sounds. If I can take a shot at it. Yeah. CPR out in the field, they, they call it out in the field, is, is um, as Mr. Bergeron pointed out, there's no one out in the field to tell them what to do. So they're going to keep doing that CPR. But when you get into a hospital setting, um, now you've got much more than CPR. You've got drugs administered. You, you've got to, as Mr. Bergeron said, they're going to crack your chest open to get to your heart. So it's much more um, uh, begun, so shall I say, <laughs> that they, they bring out this depth set um, in a hospital setting. CPR out in the field is just that. They're doing that out in the field until they get you to the emergency room. So if you sign that do not resuscitate because for the purpose you don't want to be yeah. you know, just out of nowhere resuscitated, if you are swimming and you swallow water and they would, they would have, you have a form nearby patients, they would not be able to uh, resuscitate you from even that situation, which a lot of people would cover. You're, it's, it's not that they're not allowed. Remember, you are giving a person the ability to make the decision for you once the doctor says that you can't. No, but, but you're talking about the moles form. Oh, and, and, and that's a very interesting question. I'm going to go back and talk to my EMTs about that. I guess I, I would just make the observation that chances are when you're on the beach, you're not close enough to the refrigerator that anybody's <laughs> going to see the moles form. <laughs> but, but, I don't, but I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to that. Air on right. the side of life. Remember that They're always going to err on the side of life. That's right. My, that's right. My best guess, and I say that, is if there are no EMTs around and it's a good Samaritan, and again, there's no forms around, most likely sitting on the beach, it's going to be good Samaritan's lifeguards that are going to, in, in that emergency event, if there's family members with you who then can say when the EMTs are called, because I would imagine if it's just a little bit of water that comes out, you'll be fine. But if it's a massive heart attack, which is very different than just a little bit of water, they're going to call 911 and talk to, if you are at the beach with someone, at that point the EMTs will take over and decide to keep going or not to keep going. But that would be my scenario in my head. But again, I'm not a doctor or a nurse, a lawyer, or, you know, so. Okay. I'm going to take one more question and I'm going to go back to this. Yes, sir. Along those same lines is, let's say you end up in the hospital. Is there a time limit for the medical people to take action if you can't get your proxy or your agent or any of the paperwork can't be found or there's a negotiation, there's a fight of some sort? Is it, does at some point the medical people just say we're taking over? In, in, an emer in an emergency, they will always err on the side of life. They will right. always. So they will try, and to the best of their ability, to bring you back. Um, that, that's just a given. It's only if your healthcare proxy was standing next to you saying, no, that's not what they wanted. And also, the doctor is, does not have no say in this. A doctor is going to work with your healthcare proxy. The doctor is going, to, is going to say to your healthcare proxy, this may, as, as Deb said, this may, this may be something that will help him. Let's try and see. So it's not a matter of that the doctor standing there saying, I have no opinion in this, what do you decide? They're working with your healthcare proxy. Right. And remember, in that situation, you're at the hospital. If you have a proxy, even though, if, even though you have a most, if the doctor has determined that you can't make the decision, that means the proxy is in charge. So the proxy could have... I keep I call them the proxy because it's easier for people to understand. Right, so the agent. proxy agent, right, right. Right. so the proxy agent could have that conversation with your doctor. Now I want to I want to go through a couple of the other uh, sections of this of the personal care directive just to kind of talk about the issues that are involved there. But once again, I think this conversation is really useful, and I think the, the the point of this is to get folks who are here, and especially to get people who are watching from at home, right, who oftentimes can't get here because they're taking care of a loved one or whatever to be thinking about this stuff. So um, who do you talk to about this? So you've got this piece of paper now that you've done, right, that says, here's how I want to be treated. So who do you want to have notified of this? So I'm just, I'm just raising this as a question for you. Do you want, if you've done that, if you've done that, you've, you've named your proxy, right? Uh, and you may or may not have told your kids who that is, right? And you've and, and you've and you've done a directive. So, do you want to distribute that to them, 
Well, I'm, I'm not saying I don't have an answer to that. That's a question. That's a question. I just went through, I just had a meeting earlier this morning with a client who, who said he had the, mis <laughs> the misfortune of telling his kids that, how he, that, he, how he, that he was changing his will. He said, I can't believe this. I think I'm going to have a heart attack. They're emailing me. They're all yelling. <laughs> it was terrible, right? So sometimes folks will just say, I can't, I don't want to deal with this. You know, I don't want all this tension and stuff. So you may not, right? The, no, so these are my, kind of, my observations. Um, but once again, to have a writing available, at least from my perspective, so that if you're sick, the, 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 your agent who has it can then distribute it to the brothers and sisters or to the whoever, right? That's a great idea. Do you want to have your lawyer have one? I think that's a great idea because your lawyer's obligation is solely to you. So, the, so that document is confidential in their hands unless you tell them, right, if I get sick, then I want you to distribute this to my kids, right? So are there other people that you want to distribute to? Or, or, or clergy? You know, are, are, there, are, there, are there other people that you want to have involved in the event that you're really sick that you want to make sure that somebody is contacting them? Those are my observations mm -hmm. from the two of you. If you go on the Milford, um, it's a very timely discussion that we're having. If you go on the Milford Regional Medical Center website, you'll see... This is not an ad. It's not an ad. This is the <coughs> second... Actually, um, it is an ad. Because well, good, because they're the regional hospital, right? But, but in the second, uh, in the left-hand column, it'll say advanced care planning. If you click on that, there are lots of information from the um, uh, IHI explaining how to pick a the in, the, in, the IHI. Institute of, of For Health, uh, IHI. <laughs> IHI, because I was trying to remember too, because as I was saying it, health improvement. For health improvement, IHI. Terrific organization, once again, uh, uh, developed actually by a set of players out of, out of Harvard. Right. That guy named Ber Ber Berwick? Berwick? Ber Ber yes, it's called. Don Berwick, the guy who, who got rejected as Secretary of Health and Human Services nationally because he was too liberal. This was by when the Obama had proposed him. He actually d developed all this. Really terrific stuff. And, and if you read through that, I mean, you certainly don't have to use Milford Hospital, but I'm letting you know on that website. There's a lot of information if you'd like to just peruse that as well, is what you're receiving here. And you can see the reason, you know, one of the reasons the hospital is doing this, they, this really helps them. Yes. You know, this really helps them. One of the things that Ann and I were talking about earlier was, was actually kind of thinking about, you know, e even trying to develop some kind of a conscious outreach effort within the towns mm -hmm. in your area, right? So that you can, so that you can really encourage, pe especially people over 70. You know, because I mean, who goes to the hospital? Sure, everybody goes to the hospital. But the older you are, the more the chances are that you're going to the hospital. And so if, if, imagine if they knew that 100% of their people walking in the door, they knew, how to, they knew who to call right off the bat, right? Because they knew they had a proxy, right? How, 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 much, how much better is your care going to be in that case, right? And also, um, Honoring Choices also has, if you just keep clicking on, there's a lot of reading material, but they also have definitions. What is advanced planning? What is CPR? What is resuscitation? And then this is the conversation that you then take to your physician and say, I've been reading, tell me more about this topic so I can make a decision for me about myself. And, and, and I think we've talked a lot about this already in the context of so what are my treatment choices if I'm really in bad shape? Like, do I want to get treated or not? But think about this in terms of, so you're incapacitated, you can't communicate for whatever reason, you've had a stroke or whatever, but you could be living for a long time. And you know, there are questions about, but, it, but you have cancer, do you want chemo? Do you not want chemo? There are a bunch of kind of, of, of very large, major health-related decisions that aren't those kind of final end of life decisions, you know, do I want this or not, but kind of what direction do I want to go in? And, and once again, assume you can't make those decisions. We always think about the pro proxy as only being used if you're about to die, you know, as opposed to it being used, I mean, I've had clients where the proxy's been in, in, in place for 10 years. Right? People have made a ton of decisions, right? So, so what, are the, what is the direction that you want your life to take, assuming you can't communicate it? Other comments, stories related to that? To that? I, I, I have a funny one to jump to. Good. 
do that. <laughs> Little known fact. If you have a healthcare proxy and you uh, get a divorce. Oh, I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> Your healthcare proxy, good to know, is null and void. Null and void. Unless you want that person to be your healthcare proxy, and then you have to do a new one. That's right. That came from the famous Terry Schiavo case. Right. Right. By the way, the reverse of that is um, if you have a will uh, and you get divorced, the will is still in effect, so you have to change your will. <laughs> change but if you get married, the marriage automatically invalidates the will. Don't forget, unless your will specifically says, I intend to go marry so-and-so, and I specifically intend that this will will survive. It's a little known but interesting legal fact. Yes, ma'am. Physician assisted suicide. Physician assisted suicide. That's that becoming more state? common, and there are mm -hmm. people that's a doctor at the moment pushing it out. But it, but it, but not legal yet in Massachusetts, right? Not legal yet in Massachusetts. But it un understood. I'm not sure that we want to go there only because I'm looking at my clock and I have two minutes left, and that's not a two-minute topic. That's a pretty that's a pretty large topic. Um, Notes on a peaceful death and final days. Um, so one of the, I was recently talking to my, uh, my wonderful paralegal, Brenda Costa, who's, who's, you know, who's, who's been here before, together with Cindy Cormier, who's thank you in the back of the room. And we were talking about this in terms of, you know, she was, she was talking to her folks about this. So if you are, if you are frail, and maybe dying soon, because we all, because death is only, death is just, right? Death only takes a moment, right? It's the dying part that takes a little bit or a lot of time. Um, the question is, how do you want to spend those last, that last, how do you want your last day to be? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you one story related to this. I get to do one, one story. So um, <clears throat> um, I had a partner for years and years before I moved to Mark O'Connell. We were partners for, oh, 33 years. Uh, and he found out about four years ago that he had cancer. And, and they said, well, you know, here, so here's the story. The good news is, you got a lot while left to live because it's very slow growing. The bad news is it's slow growing, and so we didn't find it until now. So you're definitely going to die soon, right? But soon's going to be like six to twelve months. And he took it in stride. It was the most um, incredible. He lived for another eighteen months, and he just said, you know, he went home, put up a sign in his bedroom for his wife, no tears. We're having no tears here. And 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 his position was, I'm going to take chemotherapy to slow this down as long as I'm not going to get nauseous, because I'm not going to waste a single one of my days trying to make, to get an extra day in which I feel crummy, right? I'm going to live all good days. So, and he loved fishing. And he continued to be not only active seeing his kids, but he kept fishing. He kept going to New Hampshire, and he would have this inflatable boat that he put on top of his head. And he'd park along the, near the woods, and he'd go through the woods with his boat, and he'd drop it, you know, or he'd inflate it then, and then he'd go fishing. And so Thursday before he died, the Thursday before he died, he was out fishing in his little boat. And I got this story from a good friend of his who I was one of the speakers at his, his memorial service and so was this other guy, who said he talked to David that day, uh, and it was a Thursday, David Gadboys, this wonderful, wonderful local lawyer, uh, whose wonderful gift in life, but his greatest gift was the way in which he died, the way in which he lived his last 18 months. Um, and so this other guy called him. So David, how are you? And they're just talking. He's fishing. It's late afternoon. David says, oh, wait a minute, I got a call. He gets another call. And he says, I, I got to take it. It's my doctor. So he takes the call. And then he goes back to his friend. And his friend says, so what, what, what was the call? He said, oh, my doctor said, not good. We just got the last MRI. You got to get home. Now remember, this was the Thursday before he died. He died on Monday, right? Uh, and so my fr the friend said, so what did you tell him? He said, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> so now I'm imagining David, who loved fishing, in his boat, and there's the sun setting. You know when you have people say, try to live each day as if it's the last day of your life? Imagine that sunset, the last sunset. So the question is, if you're incapacitated, and you can't tell your caregivers what to do. What do you want them to do, right? Do you want to be in the hospital? I shouldn't denigrate the hospital. You're a hospital, right? But I mean, do you want to be in the hospital? 
Do you want to be watching? the hospital, but right. I wouldn't want to spend my last hours. No. Do you want to be watching the sunset? Do you want to be going to the beach? Do you want, what do you want? What do you want? And it may be that your caregivers can give it to you. It may be that they can't. But, you're not, but now they're really going to try because they know what you want. Other? I, I oh. agree. And my father-in-law, it was his choice to go to this particular nursing home. And we made it happen. I mean, the, you know, Mass General wanted him to die there. We said that's not what he wants, and he's currently... Except it's so good, he's still living. <laughs> he's still he's living. living. <laughs> well, this one was very good. <laughs> um, but that, that is where he wanted to go, and we jumped through hoops to make it happen, but that's what he wanted. A and the other thing I have to just say about this journey with my father-in-law is, 2006, we had planned his funeral. I said, you know, we don't know what you want. Tell us. And we went to... Um, a funeral home and we sat down and we planned everything and one of the things I I learned is he's a, I knew he was a veteran but I didn't realize how important it was to him to have an American flag draped on his coffin I am not sure that we would have thought of that at, at a last minute we have to decide all of this a great a great and point. That was very very important to him so we learned my husband and I learned what what does he want at his funeral, and we'll make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I have a quick round of applause for my wonderful guests? Thank you. I want to thank them for coming and for sharing that. I want to thank you for sharing, sharing things here. I hope this was valuable for you, for the folks who are watching at home. Once again, we'll make sure we have the website for Honoring Choices. These are really, really important things to do, right? And you don't even have to pay a lawyer to do anything, right? Just you can do these things, okay? Thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you.